Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson with the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries. Today, we celebrate Women's History Month with a very special guest, Dr. Kelly Stewart. We'll be discussing her career and perspectives on decades of research on one of our closest living relatives, gorillas. Before we explore further, though, we'd like to thank the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith, whose generous support made today's episode possible. Now let's bring on our guest primatologist, Dr. Kelly Stewart. Kelly, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, hello, Ariel, and hello, everybody. Thank you very much. It is a great honor to be here and uh, to be part of Leakey's celebration of uh, Women's History Month. And I have to say that a perusal of the grants and the projects that Leakey has funded over the many years it's been around is a pretty illuminating little history in itself of women's effect on science and contribution to a science, namely anthropology. Well, it is an honor to have you here. And um, I, I'm just really looking forward to today's episode. Um, Kelly's you joining too. us from California, where she is a research associate at the University of California, Davis. She has studied wild gorilla behavior, ecology, and conservation in Rwanda, Uganda, Congo, and Nigeria. She began her career working with Diane Fossey at the Karasoki Research Center in Rwanda and co-directed the center for several years. In addition to her research, Kelly's been involved in writing and editing uh, uh, books on gorillas and gorilla research, and has been advisor to several organizations, including the One Gor uh, or the Mountain Gorilla One Health Program. Before we hear from Kelly, if you are watching us uh, live, please post comments and questions for Kelly anytime in the chat, and she will be answering your questions live during the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely we will be able to have your question featured. Um, Kelly, you have such a unique perspective on gorillas and gorilla research. Why is studying gorillas still so relevant? Well, we gorillas are, we humans, I mean, <laughs> not we gorillas, but that just shows how closely related we are. Uh, we humans are closely related to um, all the great apes, the orangutans in Asia and gorillas, chimpanzees and bonobos in Africa. And um, uh, the African apes are, are especially our, our closest living relatives. And so one way to understand the forces that shaped our species in the course of evolution from brain size to social systems is to understand the forces that are operating in other living primates and to then take a comparative approach. What ways are we similar to other living primates and great apes? And in what ways do we differ? And it uh, to understand the behavior of living other living primates and especially the great apes could give us a glimpse into how our direct ancestors behaved. Today we're uh, celebrating Women's History Month. Who are mm -hmm. some of the women who inspired you? Well, of course, Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey were my heroes from the very first time I read their articles in National Geographic that were published in the late 60s and early 70s. And then there was, of course, uh, Brute Galdikas and her study of, of orangutans uh, in Asia. But the very first woman to, to really inspire me was my mother because she loved animals and she loved wildlife. She got my father interested. And then our parents took us on a trip on a safari to Tanzania and Kenya uh, when I was 14. And I was so blown away by being around wild animals, I decided that I wanted to become a naturalist. And then my mother developed an interest in human evolution and human origins through her, um, through her involvement with the Leakey Foundation in the 60s. And she gave me books to read on the subject. 
And then I became very interested in anthropology. And I decided then that I wanted to become an anthropologist. So uh, Kelly, you and your husband, Dr. Sandy Harcourt, offered a matching challenge to raise funds for the Leakey Foundation in honor of Women's History Month. Um, we are so incredibly grateful for your generosity. As you mentioned, your mother, Gloria, became involved with the Leakey Foundation, and you continue that legacy. What impact do you see the Leakey Foundation having on human evolution research? Well, there's no doubt that the Leakey Foundation is a leader uh, in the quest to understand who we are and where we came from. And they are really a unique, one-of-a-kind organization that funds a wide range of disciplines in the field of anthropology, you know, from bones and stones to uh, behavior to genetics. And they are a very no-frills organization. And I have always been impressed by how efficient they are at reviewing grants, making grants. There's great communication between uh, the uh, the administrators, uh, the staff, and the scientists, and the board of trustees. And uh, um, as a result, they have launched and supported the careers of an impressive number of leading anthropologists from many countries, and importantly, many from the countries where field work is being carried out, uh, digging up bones, studying behavior, that sort of thing. Um, oh, one sec, I have an echo. Oh, it's gone away, good. Um, we are just so incredibly grateful and, you know, appreciative of your generosity. Uh, so the way the match works is actually any donation that is made in honor of Women's History Month will be quadruple match. So your $5 donation will be $20. Your $25 donation dollar donation will be $100. So we've shared um, a uh, link to donate in the video description. So please, um, if you are looking for a way to celebrate Women's History Month and are looking for an organization that uh, your donation will have a, a significant impact in, um, we would just be so incredibly grateful. So Kelly, you've had this incredible interest in, in animals and, and human evolution. What led you to mountain gorillas? Well, as I said, um, with encouragement from my parents, especially my mother, I developed an early interest in wildlife and anthropology. And uh, on one of my family's trips to Tanzania, we visited Old Divide Gorge at uh, a request from my mother, and Richard Leakey was there, and he gave us a tour of Old Divide Gorge. And I became really uh, fascinated with, with our ancient bones, our ancestors, and Richard Leakey uh, gave me the opportunity to go and be a research assistant at his site at Lake Turkana for the summer. And so I did that for three summers. And I decided then that I would become a paleontologist. And then in 1972, my mother and my sister and I went on a visit to Congo, which was then called Zaire. That's how long ago it was. Um, and we went to see wild gorillas because at that time, there was a, a British uh, scientist, uh, Alan Goodall, no, no relation to Jane, who was studying ecology of gorillas there, and a Belgian park warden who was trying to habituate a group of gorillas to tourists. So these were the very first gorillas that I met, and they weren't that habituated, but they also weren't afraid, with the result that my first meeting with gorillas came in the form of a full-blown charge from a silverback. And, um, it's hard to describe this experience, but it really embodies the original meaning of the word awesome. And when that happened, I said to myself, oh, I have to get back here. And that's when, at that moment, I, I moved from bones to behavior. 
And so I wrote to Diane Fossey and asked if I could come and be a research assistant at her at her research site, Karasoki, in Rwanda. And um, she agreed. And three weeks after graduating from college, I went to Rwanda. And that, you know, that was that. <laughs> what was it like to be at such a remote field location at such a exciting time in guerrilla research? We would love if you'd share some stories. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, the first <laughs> the first time my first day of arriving at Karasoki is probably the most thrilling thing that ever happened to me. First of all, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Um, it's uh, extinct volcanoes. It's a 10,000 feet mountain forest, beautiful meadows. Uh, it, there is no comparison. Uh, secondly, I mean, the animals themselves are awesome. And, you know, once you've been in the presence of a wild gorilla, life is never, life is never quite the same. <laughs> and these gorillas were, um, you know, they didn't charge because Diane had habituated them so that they were very used to to our presence and to people watching them. And so they could, you could actually, if you kept your distance the, and behaved properly, uh, they would ignore you and go about their day. And so it was, you know, it's very hard to describe how, how thrilling that was for me. It was also quite overwhelming, um, apart from trying to breathe at 10,000 feet, there was just a huge amount to learn all at once. I had to learn how to track gorillas, how to follow their trail. I had to learn how to approach them and be around them. Um, and uh, one of the, the most important people who taught me this were the Rwandan field assistants who, who really knew their stuff. Um, I had to learn how to speak Swahili. That's how I communicated with the uh, Rwandan guys who worked at camp. And I had to learn to recognize the gorillas because although when you when you get to know them, each one looks different as is a personality, as they're individuals. When you first meet them, there's just a whole lot of really big furry animals that kind of look <laughs> look the same. And so uh, it it was all a bit overwhelming, especially since. About three weeks after I got there, Diane went on a lecture tour, and I was there with the Rwandan uh, with the Rwandan su support team that was there, and kind of thrown in at the deep end. But it was a very exciting time to be looking at gorillas because there was still so much to discover, you know. So you could you could go out and you could you could see new things. Like I saw a birth for the first time. And uh, it was sort of quantified natural history. And so we were, we were documenting, you know, how groups form, what keeps groups together, how groups dissolve, uh, where animals move and where they go between groups. I mean, it was, there was just so much to learn. In addition, it was a very exciting time theoretically to be in in sociobiology and anthropology. And there were there were all these data coming in from other field sites on other primates like chimps and, and macaques and baboons. And that was really fertile ground for comparative analysis. We, we have a, a question that I think would be great to have now um, from Alex. Um, so uh, Alex asks, how loud and frightening is the charge and how close do they get? Well, the charge is, I won't, I probably won't do it here because if, if you thought you had an echo before, that would give, you know, <laughs> it's like a, the, a roaring scream. It's how it's described. And it really shatters, shatters the forest and the silverback comes barreling at you and you're, you don't run. You just hold your ground. And they usually stop. To, well, I mean, I've had them stop at six feet, but that that's pretty close, you know. But if they stop at 15 feet, if they stop at 20 feet, you st you feel like they're right on top of you. You know, and very often uh, you don't even see the gorilla. It's just 
the forest, the leaves shaking and trembling, and you kind of, you almost feel the earth uh, tremble. Um, but, you know, it's it's not like you see him coming at you. You just hear this great sound and, and a force coming at you through the forest. Oh, I can't, even, I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so aside from your field work and research, you've written both for academic and public audiences, including articles, papers, and books. What is the importance of being able to communicate science? And what is you what are you know unique perspectives that you gain? from it, especially working on monumental projects like your books? Well, in science, communicating one's findings has always been very important. You know, it doesn't do any good to say, oh, I had that idea two years ago if you <laughs> published it. Um, but, you know, getting published in peer-reviewed journals takes a long time. And one of the best places to discuss your findings with colleagues and to collaborate and to brainstorm is conferences. So that is, that's a wonderful part of the scientific life and researcher's life is getting together with people doing work on other projects similar to yours, but different. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of great collaboration and great, great ideas are, are formed uh, during conferences when everybody get together, they relaxed and, um, you know, that's, that's a very important part of research. Uh, but I think just as important is communicating our findings to the public at large. You know, communicating, uh, getting getting the public fired up in in the things that have been discovered, and getting them fired up about just the beauty of nature, and not just that, but in how science is done. You know, I want the general public to be fired up by the beauty of a scientific argument of an an understanding and a reasoning based on facts and on evidence you know evidence based critical thinking i think you know that's that's very important in this day and age more oh, yeah. important maybe than it ever has been this was a wonderful great ape conference in indonesia Well, I am so excited to hear more about your work. Uh, before we turn the virtual floor over to you, Kelly, if you are enjoying this episode, be sure to subscribe and hit the little button um, for notifications to receive uh, all of the uh, notifications of new episodes and more. So now let's turn the virtual floor over to Kelly and hear more about gorillas. Thank you very much. Okay, well, when Diane Fossey first went to the Virunga Volcanoes in 1967, and we have, these, these gorillas have been um, studied pretty much continuously ever since. And so the question I'm going to pose is, well, that has been posed to me by several people is, isn't 55 years long enough, what more do we have to learn? What more is there to learn about gorillas? This population has been studied for 55 years. And my answer is there's plenty to learn because the more you, you learn, the more questions there are. And, you know, if you really want to understand the society of an animal, a snapshot, which is a short-term study of a group, gives you a snapshot, but nothing can beat data on known individuals through their lives, long-term data on known individuals. And when you're studying something like a gorilla, that takes a long time because they're long-lived animals, as are many primates in comparison to other Mammals, for instance, it's going to take this baby boy gorilla um, 12 to 13 years to become a fully adult silverback. So it takes a really long time to get the life histories of individuals. What different trajectories do males and females take in the course of their lives? And from the 
decades of data on mountain gorillas, we got the basic blueprint of gorilla society. They live in relatively small, very cohesive, stable groups, usually one fully adult male and several adult females and their offspring. What holds the group together are bonds uh, between the females and the leading silverback, and these bonds are passed on to their offspring. Um, we, un, we know that females disperse to other groups or lone silverbacks, often when they hit uh, sexual maturity. And females, that's about eight years of old. They, they usually give birth when they're about 10. Um, they disperse and we have also, it's clear from data that female choice is an important part of which females reside which, which, with which males. And they usually, uh, they leave one group and they join another male during interunit encounters. So that, that's a very, um, that's a blueprint of the whole, of how the group works. And males compete with females in, um, you know, direct mono a mono competition. Um, and they do this uh, with some, sometimes in very serious fights. And what these males are doing is trying to keep their females with them or trying to attract another female to them. And they're also uh, trying to protect the group, especially uh, the offspring from aggression from other males. Now, this is, this is the picture that we got from decades of research on one, one population of mountain gorillas. And they are the, they are the least numerous gorillas in Africa. That, dark red blob on the right where the arrow is pointing is where mountain gorillas live. The pink area to the left of it, that's um, the Eastern lowland gorillas. And then all the way across to West Central Africa it is where most gorillas live. And it took many years to get data from other areas and to be able to compare gorillas in different areas. And it was very interesting because there are major habitat differences um, among gorilla populations across Africa. I mean, they're, you know, in, in, for example, most other gorillas, except most other gorillas eat way more fruit than mountain gorillas. In West Africa, they eat a lot of fruit. In, in mountain gorillas are, mainly vegetable eaters. There, there isn't very much fruit up at those heights. And so they're sort of surrounded by their food in a giant salad. I'm just going to go back here. Um, so habitat differences affect diet. They affect range size. They affect group size. And they affect other aspects of behavior. And all that took a long time to kind of work out and to figure out, because you just have to wait until all this data comes in from other long-term sites across Africa. One of the really interesting differences that has emerged between different populations of gorillas, and you know, the, the basic blueprint applies to all gorillas, but there's some really interesting differences. And to me, one of the most intriguing is group composition. So in mountain gorillas, I said most groups are have only one fully adult male, but 30 to 40% of groups have more than one adult male. And in contrast, all other gorillas, only two to 3% of groups are multi-male. And that's a really intriguing and interesting difference. And what it means is that in mountain gorillas, some males aren't leaving their groups when they reach maturity. They're staying in their group. That's how you get a multi-male group, as males mature into the group. Or it's in other groups, in all other gorillas, most of the males, almost all of them are leaving because males do not, adult males don't migrate into breeding groups. So 
the question is why? What is causing this difference? And we don't know yet, but it's a very intriguing question. I mean, one question, one thing you can ask is why would a young male not leave? Why would he put up with mating competition? The dominant male, we know now with advances in um, genetic research, we can do paternity analyses. The dominant male of a group sire is about 80%, 85% of the infants. So the subordinate male, you know, he he gets a little bit of action, but it's only 15%. Why would he, why would he stick around? Why wouldn't he go and start his own group? And why would the, why wouldn't the dominant male kick him out? You know, why, why put up with this competition? And it turns out that there are a lot of advantages to a multi-male group. When a male stays, and there's more than one adult male in a group, they, they're cooperative. They have a pretty cooperative relationship, especially when there's a threat from the outside. Both these males in this picture are, um, uh, especially the one on the right, is in an aggressive stance, um, and they're sort of confronting a an intruder. And they're protecting the group from possible predators like humans, but other silverbacks. And it turns out that one of the biggest threats, at least in mountain gorillas, is infanticide by males from outside the group. And in one male group, in one male groups, 23% of infant mortality is due to infanticide. In multi-male groups, only 3% of infant mortality is due to infanticide. And the main reason for this is that when a silverback dies, for whatever reason, and there isn't another silverback in the group, all the females scatter and join other males, even ones with little infants. And if that happens, a male will kill an infant if it's under about a year, and that brings the female back into breeding condition. So it turns out we've been able to look at lifetime reproductive success of uh, several males and the ones that spent their breeding lives in a multi-male group leave behind more surviving offspring than the males who were just single breeders. So then you ask the question, why aren't all gorilla groups multi-male? We don't know the answer to that, but it's very intriguing and we just, you know, we just need we need more data. I mean, it could be that ecological differences put a cap on maximum group size. So the really super, super big groups that have been found across gorillas in Africa have been in mountain gorillas where they're just surrounded by their food. Probably the maximum group size is smaller in populations that eat more fruit that, that that occurs in smaller patches. We don't really know for sure, but it could be ecological differences like this put a cap on the number of females that can be in a group, which would then influence male-male uh, -male competition for mating. It could be demographic differences. For example, there's uh, some data to show that interbirth interval is longer in Western gorillas than mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas, it's four, about four years between surviving birth, between surviving infants, and it's um, at least a year longer, possibly, in, in other gorilla populations. And if that were combined with, say, a higher male mortality, say in West Africa, where there are more diseases, or there's certainly um, more, more hunting, more predation by humans, that could be just enough to make it, it just takes too long to grow a multi-male group. So there are all sorts of possibilities to explain this difference. It might also be that infanticide isn't as common in other gorilla populations, although infanticide of the type that I've described for mountain gorillas has certainly been documented in other gorilla population. So we just don't know the answer um, to these puzzles. And that is one reason for long-term research, for long-term research sites. And I want to end by addressing 
to me, an equally important reason, which is that when research is com when res uh, when conservation is combined with research, it makes the con conservation more effective. Um, gorillas across Africa are facing multiple threats, especially Western gorillas. And one of these is uh, forest destruction, habitat destruction. Um, just as serious in the next slide is, uh, is quite an upsetting slide for those of you uh, who don't know, but the bushmeat trade, uh, uh, hunting for meat, uh, really hammers all wild animals. It's estimated that a million tons of wild meat per year is uh, being taken out of the forest. This isn't all ape, it's all animals that live in the forest. It's buffalo, it's antelope, it's monkeys, but uh, chimpanzees and gorillas are, are part of the hall. And there are conservation projects across Africa now that are linked to long-term research projects and they can be very effective. A best example of this is a famous example is the mountain gorilla project that was started in Rwanda in 1981 in conjunction with the long-term research. And this, this project combined park protection conservation awareness, uh, educating um, the local population, going to schools, you know, holding, holding seminars about gorillas and ecotourism. And none of these different projects in the program would have been half as effective as, as they have been without the long-term research that was told you, you know, where the animals go, how much land they need, what their birth rate is, that sort of thing. And it has been hailed as one of the unfortunately very few conservation successes uh, where, wild, where uh, great apes are considered. In 1960, George Shallard estimated there were 500 gorillas in the Virunga volcanoes. In 1972, it was down to 275. This we knew from censuses that were being run, were, uh, Diane Fossey helped run. And, and two, in 1981, they were at their lowest, one of their lowest, which was uh, two, an estimate of two, 250 individuals. And that's when the Mountain Gorilla Project started. And they have been, the population has been recovering since then. And today there are, it's estimated over uh, 604 mountain gorillas in the Virunga volcanoes. And this should be, this should, uh, this is a sign of hope for projects across Africa. In Rwanda, there is also a very impressive veterinary management program called Gorilla Doctors. And they extend, they're part of the One Health, One Health program that uh, extends uh, health screening to, um, the local humans and their uh, their domestic wildlife, but they also the gorilla doctors um, regularly monitor the health of the wild gorillas. They can compare the tourist groups with the research groups, and they conduct their own research on the viruses, uh, which is really fascinating. You know, because we're so closely related to gorillas, we all get the same diseases. So this is, uh, this is an example of how long-term research has led to all these different um, research and conservation programs. And there's just no doubt that research, long-term research plus conservation can lead to effective conservation, which is national parks. What you really want is the creation of fully protected areas. There are seven areas across Africa, seven national parks of more than 5,000 square kilometers that all started with a researcher pitching a tent in a forest that was not officially protected. And they have, that has led to national parks in seven areas. 
And on that note, I will leave you. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was um, that was a really like I, I I can't believe you packed so much in such a short period of time. Um, <laughs> um, I'm gonna actually jump right into questions. So if you are watching and have not submitted a question yet, be sure to get them in as soon as possible so we can uh, possibly feature your question during the episode and Kelly will answer it live. Um, our first question comes from Cheryl. Let's see here. Uh, Cheryl asks, uh, hi Kelly, um, are subordinate males um, uh, that stay in the group typically the offspring of the dominant male? Very good question. I think the subordinate males are if they're not the offspring of the dominant male, they are a relative. They're uh, the nephew, for example, or a much younger brother. Um, let's see here. We have our next question comes from Pete. Hi, Pete. Um, uh, could I ask, uh, Kelly, if gorillas migrate at all, do they have memory of what food is, is where and when? Uh, thinking of what shared behavior they may have with our early ancestors? That's a good question too, Pete. Um, gorillas migrate seasonally. For example, in the Virungas, there's a zone of bamboo. near In the lower altitudes, bamboo only shoots at certain times of year, and that the gorillas then shift their, their range and they hang out at lower altitudes when the bamboo is shooting so they can eat the tender shoots. Um, they, they tend to wander around, you know, they wander around all day. And there has been um, a study, studies that show that when they're in an area for a long time and they kind of smush down the vegetation and eat a lot of it, they don't come back to it for a while. So it regenerates, regenerates. And certainly in areas where they eat fruit, there because fruit is seasonal they go to trees you know that they know is fruiting and there's certain there certainly has to be a memory of they they must have a map in their brains and some people think that remembering fruit sources has been a, an important selection pressure on a uh, brain size development of brain size Really fascinating. Um, we, we're getting a lot of questions. So again, if, if you have a question, get your question in soon so we can we can uh, get to it today. Um, our next question comes from Julie. Uh, Julie asks, as an anthropology student, what new perspectives are you seeing in the mindsets of researchers? New perspectives in the mind? Well, the mindsets of researchers changes as the technology develops, you know, so, so in my day, as I said, it was quantified natural history. You go out, you write down what animals do because you don't know what they do. You know, it's new, but now you, you go out and you've got, you know, you collaborate. Things are much more collaborative because you, you want to, you want somebody that do, does the genetics. So you want a geneticist on your team and you want maybe somebody who knows about hormones. They take hormones, you know, take somebody who can dart animals and get blood, you know, that sort of thing. They're just, it's much more collaborative uh, now because there are more disciplines that can be brought into uh, any one project in the field. Um, our, our next question comes um, from Brendan. Oh, Brandon, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, Brandon. Um, when a male gorilla engages in infanticide, does that in any way change the relationship between him and the mother of the infant? That's a very good question. And, um, you know, I, I have to say no. I would say um, when a male kills an infant of a female, she breeds with him within two weeks. She stays with him and breeds. And it could be she's cutting her losses. The infant's dead. She's with this male. And, um, you know, she just gets on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from H. Mm -hmm. Um, 
H is hi, Kelly. Um, hey, H. <laughs> uh, do you know of any documented uh, COVID-19 cases in wild gorillas? I do not believe any have been uh, reported. There have been uh, COVID-19 uh, cases in a few zoo gorillas, yeah. but none so far in the wild. I'm sure the precautions being taken are... Yeah, yeah major. Uh, our next question comes from Karen. Uh, uh, Karen asks, uh, do gorillas ever adopt infants that are not their own? Do gorillas, I do not, we haven't seen it in females if it's an infant that has not yet been weaned. What happens when an infant loses its mother is that it's adopted by the leading silverback. And even if it's not the leading silverback, it could be the subordinate silverback takes an interest in the infant. So the infant, for instance, sleeps in the silverback's nest at night. And when you're in, it's a multi-male group, that male isn't sure that that's their infant. It could be the other male's infant, but all the males in a group act solic solicitously of an infant. And when an infant loses, when an infant loses a mother, it's usually adult males that step in. Really interesting. Um, our next question comes from Diane. Let's see here. Uh, Diane asks, uh, is there any jealousy between females in a group? Yes, I would say there is jealousy between females in a group. What, what you're really asking is what, what do females compete over in yeah. a group? And um, females, uh, they compete over food. So they, they supplant each other. There's a, there's a certain dominance hierarchy among the females. Uh, they also compete with each other for to be close to the silverback, the leading silverback. So they like, you know, a lot of females, you, they want to be close to them, especially if they have infants, they want to be near. So there's a certain, um, there's a certain degree of competition over, over proximity to the silverback. And that's, that's what I would call jealousy is signs of competition between females. Really interesting. Um, okay, so our next question comes from uh, Talkin Schmidt. Um, are there bones of deceased mountain gorillas kept for research purposes? And if so, what can they tell us? Yes, the bone. there are bones of deceased gorillas. I don't know where they are kept these days in Rwanda. I'm sure that the veterinarians, they do, they perform autos autopsies and they must keep the bones, but they're, um, they're bones of gorillas in collections. Um, I think the Smithsonian had a lot. I think um, National Geographic had that there were, there were collections of bones that, that uh, Diane started sending. And there's just been a paper um, of somebody who examined past skeletal remains. And they found that in mountain gorillas, there were some, there's some signs of some evidence of possible inbreeding. Of with, his jaws are slightly skewed in some skulls that there's a kind of torquing. Of, and I have to say some of, some of the gorillas we studied, they did, some of them had a little bit of a sort of distinctive tilt to their jaw. And uh, so that, that was very interesting. And of course, uh, you could also get, you can also get DNA from bones. So that can tell us interesting things. If you have enough other data on the living animals, that could tell you some very interesting things. And it can also tell you the, you know, what, what what population did this skeleton come from? Exactly. Um, our, our past lunch break science guest, Dr. Kate McGrath, actually discussed this a little bit. So um, definitely check out her episode too to hear a little bit more. Um, our next question comes from Maggie, and Maggie asks, "What shared behaviors uh, have been observed between humans and gorillas?" Well, there have been, let's see, shared behaviors between humans and gorillas. It's 
um, um, family ties, um, per, you know, relatives protecting each other. So, uh, you know, in, in, in among females, you have more friendly behavior with your relatives than you do with animals that, that, that aren't close kin. So you're, you're friendlier with the adult females you're friendlier with, or your adult sisters or your aunt or something like that. Um, males in a same group, in the same group are more likely to be related. So they're way more friendly with each other than males from other groups. So kinship, patterns are, are, are similar in that there's definitely a, a kin, non-kin difference in affiliative behavior. Uh, that's one example. Oh, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Um, if you could go, if you could like go back in, not, I guess maybe not a, a time machine, but if you could, if you could go back and, and start in the field um, today, um, what, what question would you want to, um, to, to tackle with with the new you know knowledge that we have and and the new different methods that that there are to to study gorillas. Well, I definitely think that in terms of uh, social behavior and social group, the question of um, the di dispersal patterns of males and what makes some males stay and some males leave. What what are the really important factors determining that? Um, that to me is very is a very interesting is a very interesting question, and we also have a lot to learn about the effects of different different mothering styles on what happens later. I mean, that's been looked at a little bit, but we need more data, and I think that's a very interesting topic. Well, that is that is that is I I I I, I hope that that gets tackled and hopefully we'll you know oh, have, i think it is being tackled yeah yeah and and definitely both great topics for a future lunch break science episode um my last question for you kelly is do you have any advice for those who are just starting out or hoping to pursue a career in science i have a very short piece of advice is that follow your passion <laughs> I mean, it might not be the easiest route, but but you're 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 never going to get another chance. No, it's very true. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kelly. This was just a, a phenomenal episode. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure, and I want to thank um, everybody who asked questions because I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate those questions. I thought they were great, and it it. Uh, you know, it helps me, makes me think. Yeah, we got some really good questions yeah, today. Great. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. So we have some exciting programs coming up in April. Um, first, we have a hybrid event uh, on April 5th, which with Dr. Franz Duvall. It'll be his very first talk on his new book, Different Gender Through the Eyes of a Primatologist. If you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can join Dr. DeWall, the Leakey Foundation, the California Academy of Sciences, and the Commonwealth Club, or you can join us remotely to watch this exclusive program virtually. Uh, we will be sharing a link in the chat to learn more about this program. Also next on Lunch Break Science, we will meet Baldwin Fellowship Scholar Anja Rastavindratama and learn about the complex interactions between lemurs and their environments. She'll also discuss lemur conservation in Madagascar. So definitely, we, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, again, Kelly, just thank you so much. It was just such an honor to work with you on this program and always thank great you. to hear from you. Thank you. It's been great. You guys are great. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, Bye. stay hungry for knowledge. I should beat my chest. <laughs> <laughs>
meaning your impact will be quadrupled. Subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up our newsletter to be the first to hear about exciting upcoming episodes and programs. Miss an episode of Lunch Break Science? Catch up on past episodes and browse our library of Leaky Foundation lectures on our YouTube channel. Still hungry for science and can't wait till our next episode? Check out Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, today's guest scientist, Dr. Kelly Stewart, our education programs, research grants and scholarship opportunities, human evolution news, how you can help support human evolution research and programs like Lunch Break Science, and much more. Thank you so much for watching, and happy Women's History Month. See you next time.